within the uh, paraventricular nucleus and supraoptic nucleus, there are two types of cells uh, cytoarchitecturally. One are very large cells, and they are called magnocellular cells. And then the second are smaller cells that are called parvocellular cells. So what we're going to be basically seeing today is that the magnocellular cells of the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus and the magnocellular cells of the supraoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus, their axons uh, basically come together and they come into the very bottom of the brain into what is called uh, the, um, the median eminence zona interna. So those are these big fibers. And then they exit the brain proper through what we have identified in previous uh, in gross uh, neuroanatomy. And that is the infundibular stalk. So the infundibular stalk is comprised of the axons of the magnocellular cells of the paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei. Those axons come down and then literally form what we call the posterior pituitary or neurohypothesis. And then in the neurohypothesis, there are now a lot of uh, terminals. And the terminals will release um, uh, uh, basically neuropeptides. And what did they release the neuropeptides into? Into the bloodstream. So it is a neurohormonal uh, uh, direct connection. So in a lot of ways, the magnocellular cells of the paraventricular nucleus and of the supraoptic nucleus are literally acting just like anterior pituitary cells in releasing hormones. So this then joins for us some very, very uh, interesting type of interaction uh, between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and then a whole bunch of other uh, endocrine organs. And so therefore, the field that really began back around the 1920s and 1930s called neuroendocrinology really came out of this whole area of, of looking at um, uh, uh, the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is very much looked at as a neuroendocrine interface. So that of course interested neuroendocrinologists and that of course interested neurologists because as we move through the mid part of the early to mid part of the 20th century, it became very, very clear that a number of neurological types of symptoms that could be exhibited in patients could be directly attributed to neuroendocrinology, neuroendocrinological interactions. And some of those interactions began in the pituitary gland and the pituitary glands interaction with its target organs. But increasingly, there was the idea of what? That the hypothalamus in its interaction, either uh, mediating the anterior pituitary gland, uh, th there could be deficits there, or through the neurohypothesis, there could be deficits there. And a whole series of neurological and neuroendocrinological disorders began to become elucidated. Now, at the same time, uh, uh, the idea of the hypothalamus um, 
and a role of the hypothalamus in other types of brain-borne systems started to come into play. So one thing we recognized with Pape's circuit, the idea uh, that there was some, uh, there were structures within the brain that and underwent pathological changes after long-term psychiatric issues, parts of the hypothalamus became part of what we called the limbic system. They were part of Pape circuit. So we had the mammillary bodies and then the mammillary bodies as part of the limbic system and then a whole bunch of other structures. So now what all of a sudden uh, came into play here was the uh, idea of motivation. Why do we do the things we do? And again, in a historical um, perspective, one could uh, then start to see a very close interaction between hypothalamic structures and nuclei and adjacent structures in what we called the emerging limbic system that started to explain uh, motivated behaviors, emotional behaviors, and then a whole host of psychopathological uh, issues. So now, in addition to the hypothalamus playing a role in neurology and neuroendocrinology, the hypothalamus also starts to play a very powerful role in clinical psychology and in psychiatry. So we start to really start to see this uh, tie in. The other uh, critical thing is that when we, are, when we looked at our first major, um, first major uh, uh, structure in these mini series, the thalamus, when we looked at all of the connections that were going on in all of these different thalamic nuclei, very often we were paying attention to, just like we saw with somatosensory pathways, just like we saw with auditory pathways, just like we saw with visual pathways, a heavily myelinated a type of system. And the, as a lot of the outputs of the thalamus are also heavily myelinated. So it's a lot of quick types of direct interactions. And we're gonna be basically covering that as we go on. A big difference, however, is when we look in the hypothalamus, a remarkable kind of thing happens that although we can clearly identify nuclei, by and large, virtually all of the outputs that are coming out of the hypothalamus are either lightly myelinated or they are unmyelinated. So all of a sudden, that signal, signaling processing aspects of the hypothalamus take on what we end up using, we use this vague word, neuromodulation, that what we're basically doing is the hypothalamus doesn't work as an on off switch, if you were to look at a television set or something, but rather what it is is a modulatory thing. So it's not responsible for the picture, but what it might be responsible for is the gain in the picture. And, uh, and, and how things sort of uh, uh, go together. So very much like um, another system that we talked about in the spinal cord, like the lateral spinothalamic tract, we could see all of a sudden the lateral hypothalamic tract, spinothalamic tract going to many areas of the brain that are equally unmyelinated so and and uh, modulating those things, sending uh, inputs. So we then sent inputs into the reticular formation to start to produce changes 
in levels of consciousness. We could see inputs going into the locus cerealis, into the substantia nigra, into the ventral tegmental area, into the dorsal rape, where all of a sudden we're doing attentional mechanisms or motor mechanisms or a, a whole bunch of other kinds of modulatory things. What we're going to note in the hypothalamus is again, this degree of modulation and, uh, and then how it basically ties into uh, other powerful psychological theories. So one type of major psychological uh, theory that the hypothalamus sort of ties into is uh, very interestingly psychoanalytic thought. Now you might go, whoa, wait a second. The whole point of psychoanalytic thought uh, basically attributes things not so much to hardwired things like behaviorists do, stimulus and response. And it's very easy with stimulus and response is doing what? Well, if this set of neurons now fire and they change this and they do that, you can make a system of stimulus and response and very have, have an internalized view of behaviorism from that. But psychoanalytic thought basically spends that 90% of what we're doing is unconscious in some way. So in a lot of way, and of course we have, we have uh, two different types of models, actually three different types of models that Freud basically talked about. One is the developmental model, which of course is the oral stage, the anal stage, the latency period, you know, uh, and then the phallic stage and, and, and whatever, where uh, we basically see a development happening psychoanalytically. And then the second is looking at the levels of, of, of thinking. There is unconscious, there is pre-conscious, and there is conscious. So all of what Freud basically wrote about there. But then the last thing, of course, that Freud, and probably the most famous part of Freud's model, was the structural model. That is, that there were um, three processes going on with, uh, uh, within the organism. And one process was the id, the second process was the ego, and the third process was the superego. And basically what you can basically see is this monumental uh, struggle among different parts of the personality that uh, would uh, uh, basically um, uh, form uh, this person's personality and then gave an indication as to where all of a sudden you would go into uh, the idea of um, uh, uh, the idea of psychopathology. So of course, uh, again, if we're looking at something like the id, what you're basically looking at, according to Freud, is uh, what is called primary process thinking. And the premise of primary process thinking, it has two different components. One, that primary process thinking is totally unrelated to what is going on in the uh, outside world. What it is is something that's basically inside. And the second aspect of uh, primary process thinking is what is basically called instant gratification. And again, uh, reaching back into popular culture, and now I'm really dating myself because I reach all the way back uh, into uh, the end of my college days, I always remember going out to Forest Hill Stadium uh, in, uh, in Queens. And back in 1965, I went to see the Mamas and the Papas perform at uh, Forest Hill Stadium. If you don't know who the Mamas and Papas are, Google them and look at, you know, whatever. And then, of course, as the startup act, they had these two guys, 
one guy uh, uh, was a graduate of a place where I'm teaching from, Queens College. His name was Paul Simon. And it was his friend of Simon and Garfunkel. And they came out to start up the thing. And of course they sang their song, uh, Sound of Silence, and then their, their thing. And people didn't want them to leave the stage, okay? And their mamas and papas come on afterwards, but they really stole the show. Then I fast forward, I went to a number of other concerts out there. And then in 1967, I went to a second concert that starred Simon and Garfunkel. And of course, whenever Simon and Garfunkel went out there, they had three microphones, uh, one for each of them and one for Paul Simon's guitar. And then they had a stool, okay? where Paul Simon would sit and uh, uh, Art Garfunkel would stand. And that's how they basically performed, totally bare bones. But just before that, they had to build up the entire stage because they had another act come on. And this was an act that hit the, hit the world in the spring of 1967. And it was a group called The Doors. D-O-O-R-S. And of course, The Doors was fronted by a guy by the name of Jim Morrison. And the song they had at that point was Light My Fire. And of course, you can listen to all of the work that The Doors basically made. So it was a rather uh, interesting thing between watching The Doors with their blues and whatever, and then Simon and Garfunkel. But I go to the doors and I go to um, a, 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 a basic song by the doors called The End. And a lot of it is poetry with sort of heavy blues uh, background of music. And of course, Morrison, who always was uh, incredibly provoca provocative and literally screamed and everything and wailed in his, in his songs. Basically encapsulated in the, the song, The End, a very interesting, um, a, a very interesting pair of lines. So he's basically singing and he gets to a point where he not, no longer sings, but he screams. I want the world and I want it. And then this other primal scream now. Okay, I'm not going to break your uh, things and I'm a horrible singer. But if you, I sort of fast forward when I finally started to get into psychology and read you know, Freud's work and everything like that about the id, I always found that that song and that line in a lot of ways encapsulated what the id was. Because in, in a thing was, I want instant gratification. I want everything. I want it immediately. I want it now. But I have absolutely no way to communicate with the outside world to go about doing this. So in a lot of ways, when you now go into the nervous system, and you start to think about uh, you know, Freud's id-related behaviors, a lot of the behaviors that sort of come out, and especially when one starts to talk about um, psychopathology from a psychoanalytic point of view, is um, impulsivity, uh, doing things uh, 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 that are uh, 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 either doing things that you shouldn't be doing, because reality tells you not to do it, there's signals out there, but you do it anyway. So you think about things like tantrums, you think about things like extreme impulsive behavior. And then on the other hand, uh, when you look at superego related things, you're thinking about uh, artificial constrictions upon behavior. I shouldn't do this because, and if it becomes very, very illogical, it becomes a problem. But uh, a lot of uh, sort of in related behaviors 
a number of psychologists who were interested from a psychoanalytic point of view started to look at the hypothalamus and of course started to look at the limbic system as, as sources for understanding this. And then when we start to go into things like fear and stress and the neurobiological model there, we basically start to see uh, behaviors that start to come through, not through some sensory system, like the somatosensory system, like the visual system, like the auditory system, but what, what, what might come through are cues that now trigger uh, these limbic and hypothalamic nuclei. And all of a sudden we start doing an act that we're not very, very conscious of. And sometimes in some cases, the person may actually deny that they made a response, okay? And which then gets into another whole aspect of uh, Freud, uh, not, uh, not Sigmund Freud, but Anna Freud with uh, things called defense mechanisms. So what we have here is this very interesting um, set of I, uh, theoretical ideas and everything that really start to take shape in the hypothalamus. So what I want to do is begin to really explore this little nucleus by little nucleus. And here we go. So the hypothalamic borders, and which would be the diencephalic borders, what we can see is in the caudal diencephalon, we have those two egg-shaped structures, the mammillary bodies. Then what we see when we looked at the inferior surface of the brain and we looked at the rostral surface, we basically looked at the optic nerve and the partial decussation with the optic chiasm and the optic tract. So the rostral part of the hypothalamus, which is just superior to that, is what is called the pre optic area. And uh, we, see, we see two nuclei there, the medial preoptic area and the lateral preoptic area. And then we're going to go and start to recognize that these preoptic areas have very little to do with vision. It just happens they sit above it. Then of course, medially, we saw this when we looked at the ventricular system, that the diencephalon is divided into a right and a left diencephalon by the third ventricle. And what's very interesting there is because there are a whole bunch of cells, there's actually three cell groups. There is the paraventricular nucleus that sort of sits like an upside down triangle above the third ventricle. Then we have periventricular cells that border the lateral surface of the third ventricle. And then we have another bow-like structure at the bottom of the lateral ventricle called the arcuate nucleus. Remember we use internal arcuate fibers to show the bow-like shape of the uh, fibers coming out of the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. The arcuate nucleus is a group of cells that are that have a bow-like shape right at the ventrolateral and ventral surface of the third ventricle. So therefore, the paraventricular nuclei, the periventricular nuclei, and some of the arcuate nuclei, because they are literally bordering the third ventricle, actually can have pro and send processes by which you now release uh, neurotransmitters and neuropeptides into the CSF. And what is that like? Well, it's like that uh, uh, other famous cultural song uh, done by Sting of the Police, where he sings a uh, message in a bottle where if you, listen, if you ever listen to that song, it's a guy, uh, he's, uh, uh, he, uh, he writes his feelings and everything into a message in a bottle and he throws it into the ocean. And of course, nothing much happens. And at the end of the song, he starts to get thousands of messages. And of course, 
with the ventricular system, what do you recognize? If you remember the ventricular system had the production of CSF where? The production of CSF was on the floor of the lateral ventricle and the roof of the, uh, the yeah, the floor of the lateral ventricle and the roof of the third ventricle. So in what direction is the, is any message that's in the CSF going? It is descending. It is going down into the midbrain, going down into the pons and medulla, going down to the central canal. So you can then have a bunch of periaqueductal structures and periventricular structures uh, in the pons and medulla that receive information from these hypothalamic nuclei. Then laterally, the thing that we're basically going to see in the diencephalon is that internal capsule that sort of encapsulates the hypothalamus because you can't go any more medial because of the friend, the third ventricle. You can't go any more inferiorly because you're going to go out of the brain and you can't go laterally because you have those two big boulevards of the internal capsule the posterior limb going into somatosensory cortex, the uh, anterior limb coming out of uh, a, a corticospinal uh, uh, precentral gyrus motor cortex. So then, so what does that mean? Because of those hypothalamic borders, the largest amount of communications that you're going to have are ascending and descending connections. Okay, so then dorsally, uh, what, what is above the hypothalamus? Well, of course, the thalamus, and then an area called the zona inserta. And we'll talk about the zona inserta, especially when we start to talk about the um, uh, both um, uh, neurochemical pathways and we talk about the basal ganglia. And we'll see what the zona inserta does. And of course, ventral is the bottom of the brain. So you have the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system and the pituitary gland. So now let's start to look at uh, one set of nuclei, these periventricular hypothalamic nuclei. So what they basically do is they form the lateral surface of the third ventricle, okay? And, uh, and what they also do is there's, there's fiber tracts and the fiber tracts of these periventricular hypothalamic cells, where they go is they can descend straight down into the periaqueductal gray and then descend uh, uh, straight down into the periventricular gray. So there was one nucleus that I talked about and I just mentioned when we were talking about the pons, the dorsal tegmental nucleus. That was an, a nucleus of small periventricular uh, area, just medial to the locus ceruleus. And it appears that these um, peri, uh, pontine periventricular nuclei and the periaqueductal nuclei and the periventricular nuclei form a very, it's not a clear fiber track because it's mostly unmyelinated called the DLF, the dorsolateral fasciculus. And what they're doing is communicating information. Now, if you keep going down around those periventricular zones, so you go through the uh, you go through the medulla, the periventricular, and then you get into the central canal and the pericanula gray. What we're basically finding is that these uh, periventricular hypothalamic, periaqueductal midbrain, periventricular pontine and medullary, and then pericanula are very much involved in homeostatic types of function. So they, uh, they again modulate how an organism is going to respond. Now, 
The other remarkable thing about the makeup of the periventricular hypothalamic nuclei, even though they're just a small number of nuclei and whatever, they, they form what is now called the parvicellular neurosecretory system. They're one of the hypothalamic nuclei that do that. So what, what do they do? So you have, we'll talk about in a little bit with the, uh, the uh, paraventricular nucleus, I identified what? Magnocellular cells and then parvicellular cells. The periventricular nuclei are all parvicellular cells. And what these fibers do is the axons of the parvicellular neurosecretory system come out and they go down into the base of the hypothalamus, into the median eminence, comma, zona externa, which basically places them literally on the base of the brain. So here, these um, axons and the terminals are going right down to the base of the brain. And now what can they do? They can release substances where? They release substances into a pool of blood that we call the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system. So you're literally releasing blood and it's venous blood that is sort of running away from the brain. And what that venous blood now does of the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system is it bathes the anterior and intermediate lobes of the pituitary gland. Now, we now go into a couple of historical views. One view based around 1948 was the view of a scientist by the name of Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. And what he basically proposed was a very simple triangle in which you look at the very tip of the top of that triangle and a, maybe a, a thing that occupies 0.01% of the substances involved are getting released from that little tip of the triangle. And that little tiny tip is this hypothalamic, uh, the substances that are being released from the hypothalamus into the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system where they act on the anterior and intermediate pituitary. Now, we now look at the structures within the anterior pituitary. And what they are, are a group of cells that have the ability to release a whole bunch of other hormones. So, we can look at cells in the anterior pituitary that synthesize and release ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, which is a stress hormone. We know that the, uh, the anterior pituitary can release a substance called a uh, luteinizing hormone. We know that a, the anterior pituitary can release another substance called uh, follicle stimulating hormone. We know that the anterior pituitary can release a substance called growth hormone. We know that the anterior pituitary can uh, also uh, then release something called thyrotropin releasing hormone that controls body temperature. So if we just take those and there's a bunch more substances. I just don't have the time to get into that. What you're basically looking at is the anterior pituitary being able to release these uh, uh, hormones that act on other target 
hormonal systems in the body. So what do they act on? Uh, uh, ACTH is going to act on the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland. What we know is that luteinizing hormone and, um, and, and uh, uh, follicle stimulating hormone are going to act on the ovaries, okay? What we also then know is that um, uh, uh, TRH is going to act, uh, act on the thyroid gland. And then what we know is that growth hormone uh, uh, can, it will then act on virtually many parts of the body to activate bone, uh, bone growth, uh, skin growth, etc. Okay, so here we have that anterior lobe of the pituitary with many of these very specialized cells that can release things. So of course, a big finding and the idea by Harris was that Harris was basically uh, arguing that there were some substances that originated up in the hypothalamus and maybe some other structures in the brain that then acted on um, this anterior lobe of the pituitary. And so the anterior pituitary, if we look at the triangle and this little part of uh, the 0.1% is hypothalamic stuff, that maybe the next 2% is pituitary release. So what does that say? That the hormone, total hormonal release of the body is all happening out in the target uh, areas. Over 97% of all of the hormones that get released get released by the target areas. And so the point is, is it's uh, with, as a function of that triangle, it's a cascade. Brain pitu uh, in the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary down to uh, all of the target uh, areas. So in a lot of ways, we then take the very simple word of the uh, pituitary gland, anterior pituitary gland, and we talk about it as a master gland, okay? Now, but what about that 97 or 98% that gets released and does all of the myriad effects that those uh, target hormonal organs basically do? Well, one of the other things they do is they do feedback. So those, those hormones like cortisol, like estrogen, like progesterone, like uh, 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 thyroxin, uh, growth hormone, all of that can come back and feed back in two particular ways. One is you can have what is called short loop feedback in which the amount of the substances because it's gotten stimulated by the anterior pituitary, if there's now an increased amount of those hormones in the blood, they can come back and act on the anterior pituitary. And in many cases, that the nature of that interaction between the blood-borne stuff coming from the targets, going back to the pituitary is negative. It inhibits. So that is called short loop inhibition. By the way, there's one, um, one, uh, 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 one system in which it's always a positive feedback system. And that is the ability of LH in a male to stimulate the release in the testes of testosterone. And basically that short loop feedback is positive. It just keeps on stimulating and keeps on stimulating. So if there's testosterone release, you stimulate more testosterone. In addition, the, uh, the target organs, some of their uh, outputs can access back into the brain.
they're able to go through that so-called blood-brain barrier. And they act on these, um, uh, 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 these um, per uh, parvocellular neurosecretory cells, like the periventricular nucleus, through what is called long loop inhibition. So uh, if there is uh, corticosterone or cortisol release, it can get back into the brain and it can inhibit those cells that are activating ACTH or the, um, the uh, FSH release and the LHRH release that goes down uh, uh, and can be inhibited there. So now the other interesting thing was that it was not clear, at least back in the time of Harris and whatever, exactly what was going on and how this was working. And it went to two uh, researchers who started working together, but of course had intellectual differences and for a, almost a 25 year period worked apart from one another and actively competed with one another. And one of them was a man by the name of Andre, uh, An Andrew Shally, S-C-H-A-L-L-Y. And the second was a Frenchman by the name of Roger Guillemin, G-U-I-L-L-E-M-I-N. Now, um, something totally different happening. Think about this now in the uh, late 40s and now going into the early 50s and the mid 50s. Well, what was happening in America in the early 50s and the mid 50s? Well, number one, it was all of a sudden, it got out of the, uh, you got out of uh, World War II with the defeat of uh, Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan and fascist Italy. And yet at exactly the same time, there was an argument that there was a erstwhile ally that could become an implacable foe. And just like at the end of World War I, where there was a thing called the Red Scare, in, uh, at the end of World War II, there was a very, very concern about a communist threat. And very, very early, uh, we had an undeclared war in the early 50s called the Korean conflict that drew in not only South and North Korea, but uh, uh, the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans and everything. And the Americans fought under a UN type of resolution. And of course, what happened that ended World War II so abruptly was the fact that Harry Truman uh, authorized the dropping of two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that within three years after that happening, all of a sudden the Russians got uh, the nuclear bomb. And of course, there was the trial of the Rosenbergs where you basically uh, uh, said they uh, gave away the secrets and uh, whatever. So there was this very powerful thing that then George Kennan basically called the Cold War. And of course the Cold War lasted very, very much from about 1950 all the way up to the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1989. Um, so part of this was uh, a whole idea and you might be wondering, what the hell am I talking about? I'm going to bring us back. Uh, what does that have to do with the periventricular hypothalamus? And what does that have to do with Andrew Shali and uh, Roger Guillemin? Well, uh, what basically happened versus World War I, where whenever we had people that were wounded or hurt or whatever, uh, a lot of these people died or they became so incapacitated they uh, couldn't uh, function. But in World War II or just before World War II, there was a, an amazing discovery. 
And that amazing discovery, of course, was uh, antibiotics, penicillin. So what basically now happened with the enormous amount of numbers of people who were wounded and whatever, uh, all of a sudden, a lot of these people were able to and it was called the Red Badge of Courage. And basically what it talked about was a civil war thing in which there was a young trooper where they're ready to go into battle and he pulls back, he's afraid, he just can't do it, he's paralyzed. And of course the denouement in that, um, in that uh, novel is how he gains some degree of strength. But of course you then go into World War I and you end up with, uh, in World War I, the very interesting term called shell shock, because people, what they would do is fight in these um, uh, big long trenches and whatever, and shells would get lobbed back and forth and back and forth, and they would see random people just dying and, and whatever, and a psychological thing of sh shell shock basically said this person was mentally incapacitated. Uh, then we go into World War II and we then have a whole bunch of other things going on with World War II in terms battle fatigue and things like that. And of course, all of this sort of builds up through Vietnam. And then after Vietnam, we end up talking about something called PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. And that how this um, inability to uh, work with this type of stress was not very, very uh, uh, well known. So in the late 40s, as I pointed out in another class, was the formation of the National Institutes of Health. And one of the major branches was the National Institute of Mental Health. So uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, people were looking to fund things. Now, an enormous amount of funding, you might go, well, the uh, NIH and the NIMH really basically belongs to uh, Health and Human Services. It doesn't belong to the Department of Defense. Anybody who thinks that is relatively naive that an enormous amount of this budget was basically going, and especially with the concept of a cold war and things like that, that we must be militarily ready. We must protect our soldiers so they continue to fight on in the day and eliminate uh, shell shock, eliminate battle fatigue, eliminate things like brainwashing, the whole famous thing of the Manchurian candidate. If you ever read that book or, or saw that movie, uh, you basically can go and uh, see these things. So in a lot of ways, with the idea of the, um, the brain controlling the pituitary gland and a pituitary gland controlling the uh, hormonal things that maintains a lot of homeostasis, especially stress responses, became very, very uh, popular. And Shali and Guillemin got a lot of funding. So what were they basically charged to do? One of the major things they loved to do is they knew that there was something called the ACTH in the anterior pituitary. And there was something in the adrenal cortex called um, uh, corticosterone. And they knew that that axis was extremely important in the stress response axis, and it could change 
as a function of dysfunction. So in a number of people, and especially in a number of um, uh, uh, other clinically uh, people, notably depressed people, that basically... a set of freezers. And what did he have in these freezers? He had a quarter of a ton, 500 pounds of bovine hypothalamus, not cow, not cow brain, but just cow hypothalamus. 500 pounds of this stuff. He would get it from slaughterhouses and they dissect it out and then freeze it, which allowed him to basically take samples and look within the hypothalamus for all of these substances that get uh, 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 you know, released. And what Shali and Guillemin basically did is identify in the periventricular hypothalamus in the parvocellular part of the, uh, of the uh, paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, and then many other hypothalamic nuclei that form this uh, parvocellular neurosecretory system, which goes down into the zona externa of the median eminence and then releases substances that act on the anterior and intermediate pituitary, they start uh, identifying all of these uh, substances. And they divide them into two parts. One, which, is, which were called releasing factors, so that if you had a releasing factor being produced by the hypothalamus and periventricular hypothalamus, it goes down and it activates a receptor that promotes the release of that pituitary cell to release a hormone. That would be a releasing factor. And then there was something called an inhibitory factor. So that when you released, um, uh, uh, when, when uh, uh, that hypothalamic nucleus released that substance, and it went into the zona externa, the median eminence and the hypothalamo hypophyseal system. When it acted there on a particular cell, it inhibited that cell. So one classic example of this is basically not looking at hormonal structures, but looking at the body and at how hormonal factors, especially during early adolescence, and things like this happen. And that is um, the, uh, the fact that sometimes our cells and our bones undergo growth. So what is the pituitary factor that, uh, that when released by the pituitary promotes that growth? That's called growth hormone, okay? Very simple, growth hormone. And what Guillemin and Shali demonstrated is that there is something called GRH, GH, GHRH that is released from the um, uh, hypothalamus into the hypothalamo, uh, uh, hypothalamo, uh, hypo, hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system and acts on these growth hormone releasing cells and they stimulate it. And GHRH, of course, is growth hormone, releasing hormone. But what they also discovered is that there are neighboring cells in the hypothalamus that can release something called somatostatin. Now think about what the word somato means. Somato means you know, the outer body, the skin, and you can basically think of bones. And then look at the word statin. Stop. 
So what does somatostatin do? It gets released from periventricular hypothalamic nuclei, goes through the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system, uh, is carried onto these anterior pituitary cells that release G, uh, uh, growth hormone. But when they act on those cells, they inhibit those cells. So what is there? There's a, uh, a, a gas pedal with GHRH to promote growth hormone. And there's a brake pedal with somatostatin that basically says, stop right there. Don't do it. Don't uh, activate growth. And uh, so you might ask, why would you have those things? Well, maybe under early adolescence and everything, you want that to happen. But now under, uh, uh, but now you might have somatostatin working at particular points where you want the body's energy going somewhere else. So in, in, in extreme stress or um, reproductive development or a number of other things that they, or repair from injury and whatever. So all of a sudden we now start to uh, identify a whole series of releasing factors and inhibitory factors. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, here Guillemin and Shali were discovering all of these substances. And what basically happened was, remember the reason they wanted to uh, be funded, find that stress hormone. Well, it took all the way till 1981 to find a massive 41 amino acid molecule called CRH or CRF, corticotrophin releasing hormone or corticotrophin releasing factor that's being produced to a small degree by the periventricular hypothalamus and by the paraventricular Hi, uh, hypothalamus of the parvocellular neurosequitory system, where it basically comes down and then goes through the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system, bathes the cells that are releasing ACTH and activate those cells. So uh, all of a sudden we see this cascade. Now in most of the cases, when we looked at, for instance, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone gets released by the hypothalamus to act on TSH, which, <coughs> which is thyroid stimulating hormone <coughs> getting released by the anterior pituitary that acts on the thyroid gland to release thyroxin. Okay, you have uh, uh, those things. That is a, uh, the TRH is a short peptide. In virtually all of the cases, what these substances are, whether they're releasing factors or inhibitory factors, they were uh, uh, short acting, uh, short peptides. And for the longest time, all the way up to about 1976, it was basically thought that the only reason you have peptides in the brain is they act hormonally in some way. They don't act as quote, neurotransmitters. And of course, with the discovery of the opiate receptor in 1973, this engaged a search for the endogenous opioid substance. What is it that binds to this opiate receptor? And what was found in late 1975 by Hughes and Kosterlitz was that they identified two short pentapeptides, five amino acids long, one called uh, metencephalin, the other called leuencephalin. And they found that these things bound all over the brain and that when you in <coughs> injected metencephalin or leuencephalin into particular parts of the brain, you could produce a short-lived analgesia. Uh, 
So it basically now all of a sudden put on the map the fact that these neuropeptides acting in the brain act as, uh, as a, a form of neurotransmitter. And of course, to do my story, when I told you about the quarter ton of cow hypothalamus, Roger Gehrman, after seeing metenkephalin and leuenkephalin, basically found uh, a, 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 a structure called beta endorphin, which was the C-terminal fragment of something called beta lipotropin. And this was even a more powerful opioid analgesic. And now all of a sudden, right there in those few months, and I remember it clearly because what ha was happening to me, I was getting my PhD uh, 11 days short of my 30th birthday and starting a postdoc up at Columbia working in opiate systems and whatever. All of a sudden the world, uh, the uh, neurochemical world of the brain exploded from about eight known neurotransmitters, and then you throw in the excitatory and inhibitory amino acids to hundreds of neuropeptides. And when you look at the periventricular hypothalamus, what you basically can find, these tiny little cells, what they, what they lack in terms of myelinization and everything is they have hosts of these neuropeptides that produce these neuromodulatory effects. So here in a periventricular hypothalamus, I use this as an example. You can follow this pathway here between looking at, uh, there are, uh, here you have the um, uh, periventricular hypothalamus releasing somatostatin and the uh, GNRH, uh, the uh, the arcuate nucleus uh, uh, cells releasing G GHRH, and they're dueling with each other where onto the anterior pituitary to do what? Uh, tell the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone or not. And you can basically follow this model. And what you basically see in both of these cases is what? Not only does um, the, in the uh, arcuate nucleus, does the arcuate nucleus uh, tell the um, uh, uh, tell the anterior pituitary to release uh, uh, to stop uh, uh, releasing? Excuse me. Uh, yes, the uh, arcuate nucleus re uh, uh, releases G H G H R H to tell the anterior pituitary to release growth hormone, but the uh, periventricular hypothalamus releases somatostatin to tell the anterior pituitary to stop releasing growth hormone. And whether or not growth hormone is released or not, or the relative levels of it, you can see the negative feedback that comes back into the periventricular and the uh, arcuate uh, cells. Okay, so now we got an idea here about how the, um, uh, 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 of these uh, uh, neurohormonal interactions. So now let's look at another cell group called the pre-optic hypothalamic nuclei. And what we have is we see that the preoptic hypothalamic nuclei are tra traversed in an ascending and descending way by this mostly unmyelinated or lightly myelinated fiber tract called the medial forebrain bundle. And what's that going to be doing? Lots of input coming from the locus ceruleus, from the ventral noradrenergic bundle, from the dorsal raphe, coming from the ventral tegmental area is ascending. And then you're going to have a lot of limbic nuclei descending through here. So that medial forebrain bundle is a ascending and descending pathway for limbic hypothalamic interactions. And we now look at two big functions 
One is the regulation of heat or temperature. And there we're looking at the lateral preoptic uh, nucleus, and then the regulation of sex hormones. Um, and there you're looking at the medial preoptic nucleus. And then the third of these nuclei that's in the preoptic hypothalamic nuclei is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And it sits literally above the optic chiasm. And as I pointed out before for the visual system, something like 95, 96% of the fibers that come out of the ganglionic retinal cells and go back and either decussate or not, they go back to the lateral geniculate body. Then the lateral geniculate body through the optic radiations goes to primary visual cortex. Then about 3% of the fibers basically shoot uh, from those uh, ganglion retinal cells up to the superior colliculus. And we talked about that. A very tiny amount, maybe one to 2% of the fibers literally uh, uh, go right above uh, the optic chiasm into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus doesn't tell you what to do. The suprachiasmatic nucleus tells you when to do it. And we'll explain that. Okay, so if we look at the uh, pre-optic hypothalamic nuclei here, what we can see is the medial preoptic area going to be involved in both male and uh, female uh, activity. Then we are basically looking at the bed nucleus, the stria terminalis. We'll talk about this briefly in the limbic system. And that is uh, involved in male uh, sexual behavior. Then what we see is the, um, let me just move this for a second. Then what we see is um, uh, 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 another nucleus here being involved in male and female behavior. And then we see the ventromedial nucleus and the periaqueductal gray basically involved in female uh, uh, mediated behaviors. So the other interesting thing is you have um, uh, uh, what we have are nuclei that are involved in sexual behavior, but then that are also sexually dimorphic. That is, uh, depending on the biological sex, the, uh, those nuclei are gonna respond differently. And again, a major area that one studies in this is basically looking at what is called female sexual behavior in the rat called lordosis. And what is lordosis? It is where the female um, rat will basically take its hind legs, push down on them to thrust the pelvis upward. So as the male who is entering the female from behind, uh, it, 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 it's now recept, receptive to that male. And very interestingly, sometimes uh, what you teach and what actually happens in real life um, sometimes intercedes. Uh, uh, back in uh, 1978, uh, my now wife and I uh, decided to live together in a apartment on the Upper West Side around 108th Street and Broadway. And what we basically then decided that Thanksgiving of around 1979, that um, what we uh, uh, should do is invite um, her parents and my parents, and then my sister and her then husband. So we had uh, uh, we're going to make a big Thanksgiving turkey in this small 
one bedroom apartment over in uh, over on the west side. So um, uh, uh, my wife Carol's uh, uh, father and mother come and we take their overcoats and put them in a closet. And uh, uh, my, my future father-in-law uh, would always wear a hat. And we took this hat and we put the hat right on, the, um, on this very big desk we had in the living room. So we're sitting there and we're doing, I guess what I'd call uncomfortable talking, but we were talking and whatever. Now, uh, at that point, I had two dogs and uh, four cats in the house. Um, the one cat that I contributed to this relationship was a little calico female named Misty, and she was not fixed. Carol had a big striped, uh, a tiger striped, um, a black and gray cat named Maxwell. So what now happened? Here's my future father-in-law's hat. Misty jumps up onto the desk. She stands on the desk. Maxwell jumps up behind her. Misty starts to go and growls. And then all of a sudden assumes the lordotic posture Maxwell reaches down with his mouth and clasps Misty's neck very tightly and then starts uh, sexual behavior right next to uh, Russell Greenman's hat. Now you would say, okay, that happens and whatever. And of course, they'll just do it. It will take 10 seconds and poof, they'll then run off. What basically is happening, Maxwell is going, Misty is growling and making all kinds of noise. And then all of a sudden you see Misty moving her head, looking back at Maxwell and going, what the hell's going on here? And let's get on with it. And finally, after about 35 seconds of this happening, Misty all of a sudden gets up, turns around and smacks Maxwell across the, <laughs> the head. So I don't know, you can take that for whatever it is. And uh, boom, that was that. But then what happened? Two minutes later, Misty jumps up, Maxwell comes on and they repeat it and they repeat it and they repeat it and they repeat it until finally, uh, thank God the rest of my family came and we were able to move to another uh, thing. In fact, they think what we did was we separated into two cats. But uh, basically you can look at the whole uh, 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 Frank Beach as a beautiful description of um, uh, 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 laudotic uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, sexual behavior, quote, courtship behavior followed by mounting behavior followed by intromission, and then followed by ejaculation. And the whole thing, and then looking at the underlying neurobiology of this, and this is what you can look at in the medial preoptic area. So female sexual behavior is going to be released by things like uh, the uh, uh, MPOA releasing LHRH, uh, excuse me, releasing FSH, which eventually is going to stimulate, um, uh, excuse me, I'm very sorry. The medial preoptic area is going to release GNRH in a female, and GNRH is going to stimulate, gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to stimulate luteinizing hormone releasing hormone from the anterior pituitary, and then that will release luteinizing hormone uh, 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 into the ovaries and you'll have the production of estrogen. And then the same kind of thing then happens with um, a, a luteinizing hormone. Uh, okay, I, I screwed up. GNRH is gonna stimulate the anterior pituitary 
to release follicle stimulating hormone, follicle stimulating hormone from the pituitary will now stimulate the, um, the, uh, uh, the ovaries to release, um, uh, to release estrogen. LHRH produced by the medial preoptic area will stimulate LH production in the pituitary that then releases progesterone uh, from the ovaries. And of course, in the male, GnRH from the uh, uh, medial preoptic area is then going to stimulate a follicle stimulating hormone in the male that then stimulates the testes to release testosterone. And so the MPOA in the female has negative feedback from estrogen and progesterone, whereas the uh, medial preoptic area in the male has positive feedback of testosterone to eventually continue to release that testosterone. So now, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And again, I've talked about this a little bit. You can basically follow this uh, pathway where you basically see light with glutamate release by the uh, uh, retinal cells activating the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then the suprachiasmatic nucleus is then going to do direct interactions with the pineal gland. Okay, so now let me just uh, wait here a second and look. Give me a... Okay, so at this point, before I move on, um, let's take a brief break and then we will uh, continue uh, to move on here. Let me just see where I am. Okay, so we'll take a brief break here and go down to the current, okay. Oh, I see, okay. Okay. And we'll, uh, we'll begin to talk about this in uh, a, m a moment. <laughs> 
Okay, hello. So I'm back. So, um, so now I saw I went through the chats and I saw there was a question about what's the difference between a periventricular hypothalamus and a paraventricular hypothalamus. The paraventricular hypothalamus sits on the dorsal surface like an upside down triangle above the third ventricle. The periventricular hypothalamus is sitting on the lateral surfaces of the uh, third ventricle. And then we see the arcuate nucleus sits like in a bow-like shape uh, on the ventral surface of the third ventricle. So now what we're doing is we're talking about the, uh, 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 the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. And uh, the point is that there are two general types of cells in these uh, nuclei. There are the magnocellular cells and the parvocellular cells. So the ma magnocellular cells, 100% of the supraoptic nucleus are magnocellular cells. So where's my dopey pointer? There it is. So 100% of the supraoptic cells are magnocellular. And about over 50% of the cells of the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus are magnocellular. So what basically happens, these magnocellular cells are basically capable of producing uh, neuropeptides within the cell. And of course, neuropeptides versus neurotransmitters are produced in the cell by what? A neuropeptide is uh, basically produced and assembled within the cell body around the ribosome by messenger RNA coming to the cell and basically producing codons of amino acids. So um, uh, as an example here, what you're basically looking at is two fairly related and similar neuropeptides. Both of them are nine amino acids in length called oxytocin and vasopressin. They can be produced, all of the uh, magnocellular cells produce vasopressin and oxytocin in a supraoptic nucleus and about 50% of the magnocellular cells are producing them in the paraventricular, then the axons of these cells course down and they are brought down into the pituitary. And where they are coming, where they uh, leave the hypothalamus and come into the pituitary right here is the infundibular stalk. So right around here, is the zona interna of the median eminence. So the axons go, and then they go into the posterior pituitary or neurohypothesis, and they then can take that vasopressin or oxytocin released into the general circulation uh, by localized blood vessels here. So now, the, para, the supraoptic is all magnocellular. The uh, paraventricular or PBN has 50% of their cells that have parvocellular fibers. And as you can see, as we talked about, there are releasing and inhibit, inhibiting hormones are released from these hypothalamic neurons into the high, where they go all the way down into the zona externa of the median eminence where these uh, magna, uh, parvocellular cells release their neurotransmitter into the, into the hypothalamo-hypophyseal portal system and that this hypothalamo-hypophyseal portal system then carries 
uh, 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 via the bloodstream into the anterior and intermediate pituitary. And these hormones are basically either releasing or inhibitor, inhibiting that respectively increase or decrease the re release of the pituitary hormone. So now, now let's look at the medial or, or an arcuate hypothalamus. And the arcuate hypothalamus, as you can see, is sitting right uh, 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 again on the ventrolateral surface of the third ventricle, which is sitting right here. The ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus can sit in the ventral medial zone. And a very nice example of uh, the medial and arcuate hypothalamus and what it does is it can play uh, very powerful roles in homeostatic control of feeding, sexual behavior, and aggression. And in feeding, we can see this right here, where we know that insulin can get released by the, uh, by the uh, pancreas. And if insulin is released by, uh, 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 can be released by the pancreas and fat tissue can release a substance called leptin. Now look at what happens when there is insulin release into the, uh, from the pancreas or leptin release from the, uh, from fat tissue uh, that there is a stimulatory effect of a subgroup of pro opio melanocortin substances. And what those substances can basically do is eventually inhibit the uh, intake of food. Because when do you have insulin release? You're going to have insulin release when all of a sudden, uh, when um, uh, 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 you have to basically begin and sequester glucose. And this happens some point after a meal. Also, when, uh, and then insulin will break down that glucose and allow that glucose now to get sequestered into fat tissue. And of course, as fat tissue gets sequestered, you then have a substance called leptin that gets released and a component of this POMC neuron will now get excited and subsequently inhibit feeding. And we end up calling that inhibition of feeding satiety, okay? Now, under and, but there are also substances within the arcuate nucleus notably neuropeptide Y and something called AGRP. AGRP is a, a, a goody releasing peptide. And uh, what, this, what this peptide uh, does in certain strains of mice is make the strains look slightly red. But a typical thing for AGRP is that this peptide um, uh, will stimulate food intake. So what is insulin uh, doing that is uh, sequestering the glucose and leptin is doing, saying that the glucose has been sequestered. What you're doing is stimulating an inhibitor of food intake and you're inhibiting an exciter of food intake. So the other kind of thing that we end up seeing is that the medial hypothalamus and the lateral hypothalamus have reciprocal connections. And this work has been known for now almost 70 years. And I'll go and talk about that type of interaction soon. So now let's look at this last structure. Remember we started way up in the preoptic area and things like that. Now we're working back into the mammillary bodies. And here is the caudal diencephalon. And what we know 
is that the caudal uh, diencep uh, uh, in the caudal diencephalon, the mammillary bodies um, uh, give rise to the mammalothalamic tract that we saw innervating the AV nucleus of thalamus. And the mammillary bodies receive the final inputs of the fornix, which we'll talk about when we talk about the hippocampus. Now, even though these mammillary bodies are probably the most recognizable cells in the hypothalamus, behavioral neuroscientists have done futile many, many studies where they ablate the mammillary bodies and look at behavior. And the only place where you see uh, the mammillary bodies implicated is in punishment behavior. So if all of a sudden an animal is basically taught that if it does a particular behavior, it enters into, I don't know, a particular presses a button or a, a lever or enters into a particular part of the thing and is punished for that, the animal will now execute avoidance responses or escape responses. When you have the loss of the mammillary bodies, this punishment behavior disappears. But there's not too much else known about the functional significance of the mammillary bodies. So if somebody's interested in studying something, there you go. And of course, here we have this very interesting thing of the mammalothalamic tract going to the AV nucleus of the thalamus and that the hippocampus gives rise to the fornix that of course shoots off and innovates the AB nucleus of thalamus. And it goes, uh, does feedback back to the mammillary bodies. And of course, this mammalothalamic and fornix tract was a very important part of the beginning of what Pape circuit described. So now what we have is the lateral hypothalamus. The lateral hypothalamus, whereas the ventromedial hypothalamus is clearly seen, the lateral hypothalamus is a sort of vague, large area. And uh, it's very interesting because we basically uh, go back into the early uh, 1950s and all the way back into around World War II when we looked at the interactions between the lateral hypothalamus and the ventromedial hypothalamus. And where did these studies begin? A lot of these studies began up at Yale University in a department of neurology. And uh, a, a guy by the name of, a, a, a neurologist by the name of John Brobeck was interested in a, a bunch of patients who um, uh, basically showed a pituitary tumor. And when they had this pituitary tumor, all of a sudden, these patients gained an enormous amount of weight, okay? And they couldn't control their uh, food intake and whatever. And then what he basically noticed was that there was some of these patients who looked like they had pituitary tumors, but they weren't quite the same size and they didn't have this uh, effect. But then upon looking at histopathology of the patients, what he found was the people with pituitary tumors with no attendant weight gain just had pituitary tumors. Whereas the patients with increased weight gain also showed damage to the medial hypothalamus. So that gave him the idea that it wasn't necessarily the pituitary that was producing this weight gain, but rather this ventromedial portion of the hypothalamus. And in probably one of the longest studies ever taken, it took about eight years worth of work. Uh, he and his student, Anand, because World War II happened in between here, uh, uh, basically published a paper in which they took rats, 
and they basically lesioned this ventromedial area of the hypothalamus without affecting the pituitary gland and not affecting other hypothalamic areas. And what they found was that in the ventromedial hypothalamus, if that lesion was confined there, all of a sudden the animals experienced an uh, a enormous weight gain. And it was divided into two portions. One which was a dynamic gain that happened literally after the animal came out of anesthesia and maybe for the first two or three weeks to a month afterwards in which these animals ate and ate and ate and ate and gained weight and gained weight and gained weight. And they then went into a static weight gain in which this weight gain leveled off, but the weight was maintained at much higher levels. Now, um, so Anand and Brobeck find, have this finding and they basically argued that this ventromedial hypothalamus, the basic function of the ventromedial hypothalamus was satiety, okay? So it was uh, satiety and that it would basically tell you stop eating. And the idea was is that the destruction of this so-called satiety center made the animals overeat. So a series of studies uh, came on and there were two very interesting aspects to these studies. One was done by probably one of the most uh, preeminent uh, physiological psychologists of the 20th century. His name was, um, was uh, uh, Neil Miller. Neil Miller looked at these animals with ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus uh, lesions. So these animals are gaining weight. These animals are eating a lot. And he then basically asked, um, how would these animals work for food? And one of the most ingenious little contraptions for a rat, I'm, maybe he was influenced by the great movie, Ben-Hur, you know, we have the chariot races with the horses. He basically created little carts that he could affix to, the, to a rat. And then what he started doing was putting lead uh, weights into the cart. And what the animal would do is the animal would have to traverse a runway to get to food. And of course, a ventromedial hypothalamic lesion rat would perpetually run down that runway unimpeded to eat. You know, it's a little short distance, that's all it had to do. But what he, and, and it would do it far more often than an animal that didn't have a lesion, okay? Which would be indicative of an increased drive to eat. But if he now put, put weights in the, the little cart behind the animal, a ventromedial hypothalamic lesioned animal would all of a sudden stop running much sooner as the work got harder, okay? So they're running less because of the increased demand for weight, uh, 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 increased demand of work. Very interestingly, at the same time, a guy by the name of Stanley Schachter, a social psychologist, was basically studying in social psychology, people of different weights and whatever, and uh, th they would come into a waiting room to do some cognitive test. The cognitive test had nothing to do with the experiment. What the person was doing inside the waiting room was uh, uh, the, uh, the experiment. And the case was, it basically the person would say, uh, come in, you have to wait 15, 20, 30 minutes. 
And what they would have is either a bowl of shelled peanuts, peanuts without shells, or peanuts that had shell, the shells still on them. Or they would have a little tray of little sandwiches that had no wrapping versus a little tray of sandwiches that had wrapping. And they basically found in these social psychology experiments, a person who was overweight would, yes, they would eat more of the peanuts that were already shelled, okay, than a normal weight person, but they would eat less of the peanuts that had a shell around them. And they basically took Neil Miller's argument of, well, the uh, BMH animal wouldn't eat for uh, uh, work, uh, uh, wouldn't work as hard. Of course, you can have an alternate explanation that shells or little wrappers of sandwiches left after you uh, might be an indicator to somebody else. And they look and they basically call, oh, look what the fat guy just left, okay? And then you have all of the negative attributions that you give to overweight people as lazy, uh, slobs, et cetera, all of that. <laughs> A very, very interesting parallel. But in any case, what you basically found is that these uh, animals were, uh, were uh, eating a lot and they were maintaining that increase, but they didn't work very hard. And then what you also basically found is what these animals would also do is they would be very, very sensitive to adulteration of the food. In most of the cases, the animals were just given a plain old uh, rodent chow, okay? But now what you could do is make a rodent chow that had various degrees of sweet in it. And what you would find is that these animals were uh, BMH lesioned animals were much more sensitive to uh, taking in the sweet and they would overconsume much greater than, than another animal. On the other hand, if you adulterated the food to make it bitter or sour, they would be very sensitive to that as well, and the animal would not, uh, would stop eating sooner. So all of a sudden you had this adulteration, and of course, people were talking about um, a so-called satiety center and altered pleasure within the BMH. Now, at the same time, a guy by the name of Elliot Steller in the University of Pennsylvania started to study an area right next to the BMH called the lateral hypothalamus. And uh, what he basically did with one of his graduate students who then went on to renown named Philip Teitelbaum, what they started to do is do pump tape lesions of the lateral hypothalamus. And what they found was that an animal that had a bilateral lesion of the uh, lateral hypothalamus all of a sudden started to lose weight. Number two, what these animals then started to do is they started to um, uh, uh, obviously reduce their food and water intake to a point where Teitelbaum basically talked about four different deficits. In stage one, the animals lost an enormous amount of weight and they refused to eat or drink. That's aphagia, G, and adipsia. And that what you would literally have to do is force feed them or make them uh, drink. Then within about a week, the animals would eat and drink, but at a much lower level and continue to lose weight. Then eventually they would uh, level into phase three, which was a lower amount of water and food intake with a lower intake. And then in phase four, if you would all stress the animal, the animal would not respond to food deprivation. It would not respond to glucose privation it would not respond to lipoprivation. So the idea then was that the lateral hypothalamus, 
was, quote, important in hunger, and that law, uh, 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 and that, you know, the drive to eat, and that if you lesioned or destroyed that area, you knocked away that uh, uh, drive to eat. So by the mid 1950s, we had an incredibly convenient way of basically talking about a, uh, uh, what that then turned out to be hypothalamic uh, feeding centers where the ventromedial nucleus was there to say, stop eating. And the lateral nucleus was there to say, start eating. And what you found was reciprocal connections between the lateral and medial hypothalamus to do the yin and yang of food intake. Now, at the same time, and we can start to see a whole motivational thing being built here, was the idea of hypothalamic aggression. And again, a lot of this work emanated from Yale University in the 1950s done by a guy by the name of John Flynn. So basically uh, uh, what you have is when you're looking at uh, animals and particularly cats, uh, what you can basically see, a cat is an incredible animal for the study of two different types of aggression. One which is called affective aggression and the second, which is called predatory aggression. In affective aggression, most of this aggression is done within the species between two cats. Whereas predatory aggression, and I know this every day, I looked down at my feet yesterday afternoon and there invariably was yet another liver and a little piece of tail that you know, one of my cats brought in after he finished eating the rest of the animal and probably regurgitated this. So I had to pick it up and get rid of it. But the point is in predatory aggression, it is basically uh, aggression towards another species, usually for what? To eat. So, uh, and when you basically look at it, you can't see uh, the same cat doing two totally different things. In predatory aggression, and many times when I'm up here, I uh, either interrupt or I see the cat way off at a distance and leave off, in which a cat will literally sit and lurk behind a blade of grass, you know, hiding and waiting and there's something out there in the bushes. Well, in this picture here, this guy looks like my old uh, cat, Hank. And uh, Hank was a black and white guy. And I could see him many, many times in this haunch type of position, the ears forward, the eyes focused. And of course, we're paying attention to a group of pigeons and maybe I'm gonna strike and get that pigeon and whatever, and they can look at this in the feline species through innumerable um, nature shows as to how you do the predatory uh, 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 behavior. And then in, in uh, effective aggression, all of a sudden here, what is this animal trying to do? Is it trying to make itself as inconspicuous as possible? Whereas in affective aggression, you have an animal trying to make itself look as large as possible. So you have that interesting thing called pilo erection, P-I-L-O-E-R-E-C-T-I-O-N, which basically means what? Hair standing on end. So the animal, especially its tail, gets completely in, uh, uh, inflated and the animal sort of like the Halloween cat uh, doing. Usually what you have is the ears pinned back, the mouth bared, and the animal is making every possible kind of guttural growl and whatever uh, with the other thing. So what's the interesting thing? In predatory aggression, if there is successful predatory aggression, 
this cat is going to kill something else and maybe ingest it. In affective aggression, there's an enormous amount of noise between these two cats that go on and on and on. Yet at the end of the day, nobody dies. There might be a couple of scratches here and there, and they and 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 that's basically uh, the end of the thing. So there's two different motivations as to why the predatory is to get food, the effective aggression is to do dominance, having to do with either territory or having to do with uh, sexual dominance, etc. And what was very interesting is what Flynn demonstrated is that the medial hypothalamus and animals with medial hypothalamic lesions will basically um, be uh, uh, have mediation of affective aggression, whereas lateral hypothalamic stimulation or lateral hypothalamic lesions play a much more powerful role in predatory aggression. So again, just like in feeding and um, uh, 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 feeding aggression seems to have these parallel pathways. And again, this very much fed into the idea of um, these so-called centers. Now, when you think about a center, uh, if you were to just do a neural construction of a center, it basically should be uh, a very well-defined group of cells that uh, seem to have control over a whole bunch of other things. What we basically find with both the VMH and the LH is, yes, the VMH is better formed than the LH, but it doesn't look like a very big center. It's unmyelinated. And it goes many different places and it gets a lot of diverse uh, input. So basically with the feeding responses, when people started to look at, when you do a lesion of the ventral medial hypothalamus or you do a lesion of the lateral hypothalamus, what are you doing? You're destroying the cells, but you're also destroying the ascending or descending fibers that are passing through those cells. And finally, um, what started to happen was techniques in the late 1960s, especially done by a guy named John Olney, who basically, uh, uh, what you could basically do is take a cell or group of cells and selectively destroy it through what is called an excitotoxic lesion. And what you're doing there is you're using um, the, uh, uh, the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate and you're exciting the cell to death. So one classic old way of to do it is to literally administer uh, during the perinatal period of animals, uh, the uh, 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 the substance that used to come in a red uh, uh, thing that was in uh, many people's um, uh, kitchens called accent. Accent you used to put on food because it would accentuate the food. It was pure monosodium glutamate, MSG. And of course, way back in the day in Chinese, American Chinese restaurants, I don't want to insult any a Chinese person, but American Chinese restaurants would put in tons of MSG. And of course, what people would then come home is they basically say, after eating a meal, uh, I would have a headache. And part of that headache was due to the MSG. But if it's given during a critical period of development, <coughs> the MSG would do excitotoxic lesions. So they would do excitotoxic lesions of especially the ventral medial hypothalamus. And all of a sudden, what did they discover? What they discovered that lesioning those cells, which is supposed to be the center, all of a sudden didn't, it had some of the hallmarks of the, um, 
of, of, a, of a satiety center. That is it mediated insulin release, but the whole thing of the weight gain and things like that just didn't happen. So then a series of studies were then done saying, where are the fibers that are, around, that are going through the BMH, wherever they coming from? And people started to do knife cuts of fibers all around the ventromedial hypothalamus. And what they discovered where the weight gain was coming from was when the fibers that were coming out of the paraventricular nucleus and went through the ventromedial nucleus, those were the fibers that were important, plus the fibers that were ascending through the ventromedial nucleus from the ventral tegmental area, dopamine fibers. So all of a sudden, people started to discover that this was no longer a center, but rather, uh, uh, yes, the cells were doing things, but this confluence of information. And the same kind of thing happened with hypothalamic aggression. It was depending on what were the amygdalofugal fibers, fibers leaving different parts of the amygdala that basically controlled whether you would see an effective aggression or a predatory aggression. And then how those fibers went through the BMH and then back down to the periaqueductal midbrain and then out. So there are uh, uh, the interesting metamorphosis of basically uh, uh, identifying uh, aware of things. So does that mean that the ventromedial and lateral hypothalami are not involved in food intake? Of course they are, but they're not the centers or the center of the universe for it. Rather, just like everything else, it's a massive feedback and interactive system. So now let us go uh, back to uh, uh, another very important aspect about the hypothalamus that I started off with, was, which was stress responses. And in stress responses, we have something called a stressor. And the stressor can be one of three things. The stressor could be the stimulus, the stressor could be the response, or the stressor can be the mediating factor. In some way, shape, or form, it's going to affect the brain, and we'll talk about where in the brain. And then uh, one arm of it is going to create, is going to change the adrenocortical system, whereas the brain is working on the anterior pituitary, that then works on the adrenal cortex, that then ends up with the release of uh, glucocorticoids. Then the second branch of this is that the brain influences the sympathetic nervous system that then mediates the adrenal medulla that then ends up with the release of norepinephrine and epinephrine. So let's start to look at the adrenocorticotropic uh, system. Okay, so basically what we have is either the stressor itself, the stress response, or the stress mediator will act on the hypothalamus. And in this case, where in the hypothalamus, the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, and specifically what part of the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, the, that part which is parvocellular, and that is projecting out of the paraventricular nucleus down into the zona externa of the median eminence. And at that place where it interacts with the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system, uh, all of a sudden, these cells that contain CRH, corticotropin-releasing hormone, get released and CRH now goes into the bloodstream. The bloodstream bathes the anterior pituitary and the cells that contain ACTH. 
CRH stimulates the release of ACTH from the anterior pituitary. So now ACTH is getting released. ACTH is getting released. It now travels through the blood down to the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal cortex can release either cortisol in the human or corticosterone in the uh, animal. And of course, what is basically happening when there is a stress or a stress response or a stress adaptation? During this time, there is a parallel action going on in the cardiovascular system, such that there is an increase in the number and activity of red blood cells. Why? Because they're carrying oxygen, which is extremely important. There's an increased blood flow of oxygen during stress, okay? And uh, also within the red blood cells, you're carrying glucose for fuel. So correspondingly, what is being suppressed? What is being suppressed is white cell blood cell production in lymphocytes. And what are white blood cells there under normal conditions for? White blood cells are there to prevent infection and to fight infection. So therefore, if, you, if during stress, you have a reduction in white blood cells, you can be immunocompromised, okay? So how does the body adapt to the ability of uh, uh, the white blood, because the major thing of stress is not to do things in the brain. The major thing in stress is to increase oxygen and glucose to all parts of the body, including the brain. The adaptive response here of the adrenal corticotrophic system is to pr provide a short-term adaptation to the immunosuppression of the reduced white blood cells. And that is by the release of cortisol or corticosterone, which is basically going to fight infection, okay? So now the other interesting thing is that this ACTH system does one of two things, that this ACTH system, when ACTH is getting released by the pituitary gland, ACTH itself can carry up into the bloodstream and basically tell the paraventricular cells that are releasing CRH to stop doing so. It's telling them that we got the message and stop doing this response. If all of a sudden, if all of a sudden, here's a model for P PTSD, if all of a sudden this negative, the short loop negative feedback system doesn't work, all of a sudden CRH still gets released. Furthermore, ACTH acts on the adrenal glands and cortisol gets released. And cortisol can flow back through the bloodstream into the anterior pituitary releasing ACTH and does what? Short loop negative feedback and cortisol can go through the bloodstream, pass the blood brain barrier, go to the uh, corticotropin releasing hormone cells of the uh, parvicellular cells in the um, uh, paraventricular nucleus and exert long-term negative feedback. Loss of this cortisol response, and this is seen very much in, um, in depression, is um, the fact that uh, this doesn't happen and the stress goes on. So in depression and psychiatric things, we have a classic um, artificial uh, corticosteroid. And by the way, this artificial uh, uh, corticosteroid that's been known about for about 80 or 90 years ago 
just entered the public consciousness to, uh, again with COVID. And that synthetic corticosteroid is called dexamethasone. And dexamethasone in some of these COVID patients uh, seems to relieve some of the symptoms and reduce the probability of having rampant lung, lung infections that eventually goes to vent ventilator and goes to death. But when you basically, what you can basically do is you can take two populations of people, people that are quote unquote normal and people that are depressed. And that basically, if you give dexamethasone to a um, quote unquote normal person, and you then look at a, a, a stress response, the, dexam the dexamethasone uh, does this suppression of the stress response simply because it's acting on this short loop and long loop negative feedback. In a depressed person, this doesn't work as well. That basically argues that part of the depression is a biological deficiency of this sort of uh, uh, stress response. And now we have a second aspect of the, um, of the stress response. And this is called the sympathomedullary system. In the sympathomedullary system, not only do we have, we have an adrenal gland and an adrenal gland is, is made up of two different types of tissue. One is called the adrenal cortex and the other is called the adrenal medulla. And the adrenal medulla is in the center. The cortex is sitting on the outside. And the adrenal cortex, of course, is releasing corticosterone. And the adrenal medulla is releasing, among many other things, the catecholamines, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. And how does this happen? Well, again, according to that Harris model, that the stress type of response not only works in the hypothalamus, but it also works in two noradrenergic nuclei, the locus ceruleus and the pons, and norepinephrine cells around the nucleus tractus solitarius. Now, the noradrenergic cells in the uh, nucleus tractus solitarius descend down into the pericanula gray. A subset of locus ceruleus cells also sends noradrenergic projections into the pericanula gray. At the thoracic level, there are then cells in the pericanula gray and surrounding intermediate, core, uh, intermediate spinal cord that now project out to the sympathetic ganglion. What's the nature of those cells? The norepinephrine comes down, synapses on these cells. These cells are glutamatergic and the glutamatergic uh, excitatory point goes out to the sympathetic nervous system. Now the sympathetic uh, ganglion contains epinephrine and norepinephrine, considerably more than what's being released by the locus ceruleus and that uh, uh, nucleus tractus solitarius. So again, we have that Harris model of amplification. Then the sympathetic ganglion is now releasing norepinephrine and, uh, and uh, epinephrine into the bloodstream and it flows down to the adrenal medulla of the, uh, of the adrenal gland. And now what is that going to do? That's gonna produce a cascade, much larger release of norepinephrine from the uh, sympathetic nerves and from uh, the adrenal medulla and epinephrine from the adrenal medulla. And now you start to see some of the classic types of responses to stress. What do you see? 
you see an increase in heart rate, tachycardia. You see an increase in blood pressure, vasoconstriction. You see an increase in breathing uh, that, uh, in respiratory rate. You see peripheral vasoconstriction. And then what you see is coronary and bronchial dilation. And then you see the very rapid movement of glycogen into the muscles for activity. So all of a sudden you now have a full, uh, full blown uh, stress response. One mediated by the adrenal cortical system, one mediated by the uh, sympathomedullary system. And here is the, uh, an interesting uh, drawing of uh, a number of different cells that are involved in here. So one thing you can see here is the locus ceruleus uh, being uh, activated. And here you can see the paraventricular nucleus. There are also interactions of the raphe, interactions of the amygdala, interactions of the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, all interacting. Now, the most important thing is norepinephrine is getting released from the locus ceruleus and the nu nucleus tractus solitarius to start this cascade. And CRF is being released to start that ACTH cascade. So are they coordinated? Yes. CRF containing cells in the parvocellular cells of the, uh, of the um, paraventricular nucleus sent fibers directly back to the locus ceruleus where they release CRF to ex excite noradrenergic cells and noradrenergic cells in turn from the locus ceruleus project up to the CRF containing cells of the parvocellular branch of the paraventricular nucleus to excite that. So there is a bilateral interaction between the locus ceruleus and the paraventricular nucleus to coordinate the two major parts of that stress response. And then what we can then follow from this is we then can see a whole series of animal models in which uh, either of these nuclei are interrupted or whatever. And then what you can also see with chronic stress down regulations of these systems that might be the neurobiological equivalent of, um, of, uh, of PTSD. So there we are with these little hypothalamic nuclei. Uh, again, it's like uh, that uh, children's book, The Little Engine That Could, in which we basically see uh, a whole host of, of, uh, of uh, behaviors. Okay. So with this, I'm now going to use uh, the next half hour because I'm always feeling unbelievably uh, behind uh, and want to bring you up here. So we're going to move on to um, the next lecture, which of course is a highly related lecture to the hypothalamus, and that is the limbic system. So one of the things you always find that is a um, that is a, uh, a, a, a an ability to teach neuroanatomy and a sort of lazy man's thing is that uh, luckily in the last um, uh, forty five years that I've been uh, involved in teaching some kind of neuroanatomy somewhere either at Columbia and then uh, now with Queens and at the Graduate Center is the fact that we haven't grown a new lobe or, or, or something. We haven't all of a sudden created a new part of the brain. All we know about 
is that there are more things about the brain. But if there is ever a quote structure in the brain that was first of all identified and then grew like Topsy, it is the limbic system. And basically you can take the word limbic and think about the surround or around. So very often one can look at, uh, again, if you go back to McLean's idea of the Triassic brain, where he basically has a core that is an ascending sensory core and then an, a descending motor core and the whole idea in the uh, uh, a most reptilian brain is an animal just snaps out. Stimulus response, boom, you go and do it. Then you get into the second layer of the, of, of, of the so-called Triassic brain is the old argument of some sort of a modulation. And here, the limbic system is beautifully positioned by having interactions uh, with the cortex, interactions with the basal ganglia, and then having some kind of modulation uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of activity. So that, um, and here we talk about more of an emotional kind of brain. So think about, uh, again, going back to culture and uh, 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 probably one of the great movies of 1975, the movie that put uh, Steven Spielberg on the map was the movie based on Peter Benchley's novel called Jaws. And of course, Jaws was this great white shark uh, in which it was terrorizing a New England uh, beach. And of course, uh, whenever we think about it, we think about it in today's world and we think about the presidential campaign and uh, whenever anybody wanted to basically look at Donald Trump's response to the, uh, 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 to the COVID epidemic, it's sort of the response of the mayor. If anybody has never seen the movie, go see the movie. Uh, the, the mayor of the New England town going, nothing is wrong as this shark is uh, eating, uh, eating up uh, the people who are on the beach. And, um, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the thing is uh, the, uh, the point uh, between three people who go out to, fight, uh, to hunt and kill the shark. One person is the police chief played by a guy named Roy Scheider. The second is the sort of shark expert, academic expert that's played by Richard Dreyfus. And then the third is played by this unbelievably irascible um, uh, 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 boat captain played by a guy named Robert Shaw. And there is this unforgettable scene in which just before they had the denouement with the great white shark, they're sitting, sitting in the cabin drinking. And um, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the, the land lover, um, Roy Scheider, the police chief is just sitting there and he's sort of us watching this interplay between these two other guys. And it's their, their encounters with sharks. So the Richard Dreyfus character goes, he pulls up uh, a thing, he goes, I got bit here and you see a score. And then Robert Shaw goes, I got bit here, I, here's a score. Here's another score. Here's another score of their interactions with great, uh, 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 with various types of sharks who bit them. And then finally, Richard uh, Robert Shaw pulls up his shirt and he has this massive scar along his uh, torso. And uh, and the Richard Dreyfus character goes, "What? Uh, what did you? Uh, what did you? Uh, uh, where did you get that? And Robert Shaw goes, the Indianapolis. And you see Richard Dreyfus's face get all white. 
And Roy Scheider, who doesn't know about the Indianapolis, goes, what went on? And they said, the, the Indianapolis was a, uh, was a ship that was delivering the necessary materials to, for, the, uh, uh, for the creation of the nuclear weapon that was eventually dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was so secret, nobody ever wanted to tell where the Indianapolis was. And then all of a sudden the Indianapolis uh, gets sunk after the delivery. And all of the men go into the water and something like two thirds of the people who went into the water after the Indianapolis sank until another ship was able to come by and re rescue them, two thirds of the, uh, uh, of the people were killed by sharks. So the Robert Shaw character basically talks about this in terms, he goes, have you ever looked into a shark, into a shark's eyes? It basically uh, just stares black you. The whole thing of the, uh, even though a shark is not cold blooded, <laughs> the cold blooded aspect, that stimulus response, it's, it, 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 it's not like it's emotional about killing you, it's a killing machine. And that basically when we think about the limbic system, we think about not only horrible things about emotion like aggression and things like that, but what you're also thinking about is the emotional tinge to all of this. And that's what this original Pape Circuit was looked at in terms of, in terms of the, um, uh, 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 the underlying uh, changes in uh, neuroanatomical structures with chronic psychopathology, the whole emerging aspects of psychopharmacology and then the tie-in with psychotropic drugs having playing roles in catecholamine circuits and in dolamine circuits. So that when you basically take that original sort of limbic system, which is the mammillary bodies uh, uh, basically going, uh, going up into the thalamus, the thalamus going to the cingulate gyrus, the cingulate gyrus going into the entorhinal cortex, and then going into the hippocampus, all of that, that simple circuit, you then have to overlay the, in the 1960s, the identification of the catecholamine circuits that modulate every aspect of the limbic system. And that the catecholamine circuits and the serotonin circuits that modulate the system, obviously are tied right into the underlying psychopharmacology of norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin type uh, drugs that then modulate not only um, psychopathology, but modulate virtually every aspect of, of behavior. Then on top of that, in the 60s and 70s, and then further on afterwards was the idea that track tracing, uh, orthograde tracing, retrograde tracing, trans uh, neuronal tracing, basically took this limbic system and grew it and grew it and grew it. So here, one of the things that we're looking at with the uh, limbic system is uh, again, playing a role with dopamine. And if you remember, I talked about this uh, two mesencephalic dopamine uh, nuclei, the substantia nigra, which mostly goes up to the nigrostriatal system, the chordate and putamen, and modulates extrapyramidal motor movement. But then we have the ventral tegmental area that basically has two major types of outputs. One, which is a mesolimbic uh, output going uh, to such places as the septum, the nucleus accumbens, and the amygdala, and then a mesocortical dopamine output uh, 
going up to the prefrontal cortex. So what we see is an output coming from the BTA. We can also look that when you look at the RAPE, you will see the RAPE innovate these limbic areas and also in, uh, innovate the frontal cortex with serotonin. And then we're gonna see the locus ceruleus with the noradrenergic uh, uh, output uh, modulating the limbic system and modulating all four areas of the cortex. And then the uh, dopamine pathway interacts with the RAPE pathway, which interacts with the locus ceruleus pathway and vice versa to produce a system. Now, that's mostly an ascending system, but then what do we know? What we know is that there are very strong reciprocal connections among the amygdala with the frontal cortex, with the nucleus accumbens with the prefrontal cortex, with the septum and the prefrontal cortex, and then the fact that the prefrontal cortex then directly sends descending modulation of the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, and the septum. And then these will send out through basal ganglia and extra pyramidal things, motor types of outputs. So let me basically look here to see where I am. Okay, I still have a few more minutes, so I will uh, just move on to the next slide. So the one I will begin with and probably not finish with is the amygdala. And the amygdala is actually a complex. It's a complex of cells. Literally, you can talk about six different groups of cells uh, or uh, subnuclei, but we'll talk about them in terms of uh, three groups corticomedial nuclei, basolateral nuclei, and central nuclei. So the first thing that I want you to sort of pay attention to is before we start to look at the outputs of the amygdala, look at the inputs. So first of all, the amygdala through the fornix is innervated by the hippocampus. So whole things about short-term memory. And then what we we're also going to see here is that the amygdala will eventually have outputs that can affect the hippocampus either directly or indirectly. The other thing is where, the, where is the amygdala? The amygdala, if you remember, is buried deep within the medial uh, temporal lobe at the rostral, the rostral end. And as such, it is surrounded by this stuff called entorhinal cortex. And this entorhinal cortex is carrying cortico-cortico connections through what is called the ventral stream. So when we talked about the thalamus, I basically talked about the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus. And the dorsomedial nucleus of the thalamus uh, was um, getting uh, 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 getting information going up to the frontal cortex. And uh, it was carrying all kinds of sensory information. And the reason it could do that was because the amygdala and the surrounding medial temporal lobe projected up to the dorsal medial nucleus thalamus. And that entorhinal cortex there was carrying tertiary visual information, tertiary um, somatosensory information, tertiary auditory information, and this all flows into the amygdala. So the amygdala has information about what? The uh, 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 recent memory, it has information about 
um, recent sensory events. It gets inputs from the thalamus. It gets inputs from the septum. And what we're gonna be basically talking about is classic work of the septum by uh, a, a famous Nobel Prize winning Swiss physiologist named Hess, who basically created an anim uh, animal using cats in which he did lesions of the septum and would literally put the animal into almost a perpetual affective aggressive state that what these animals would basically do is that the, uh, 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 it would be basically called septal rage. And of course the septum is then connected to the BMH, which again is not surprising in effective aggression. Then of course you have a major projection from the prefrontal cortex onto the amygdala, which then is going to have a connection between cognitive and emotional interactions. We then have connections from the lateral and medial hypothalamus to either enhance or reduce feeding responses, sexual responses, and aggressive responses. And then of course, from the brainstem, what we're talking about here is noradrenergic containing nuclei, serotonin containing nuclei, and dopamine containing nuclei projecting up into the amygdala. And then you look out this and you see that famous emotional responses of fear and uh, whatever uh, coming out of the amygdala as embodied by James Lang theory, Canon Bard theory, and of course the work of Joe Ledoux. So some of the things of some of the connections that come in, so cortical medial nuclei, look at what cortical medial nuclei get. They get information from the olfactory tract and you have the amygdala getting this cortical medial input. And again, you basically look at animals and you ask the simple question, um, how does an animal know whether um, there's a food source? They can sort of smell it. How do they know there is a potential um, uh, uh, territorial uh, uh, aggressor, uh, you, you know, in intraspecific? They can smell it. They can also smell uh, predators. They can also smell prey. And then most of all, they can smell uh, a, 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 a sensitive conspecific. And uh, um, again, um, do humans have the same degree of responsivity as a rat or a dog or a cat? And the answer is no. But then, uh, gee, there's some groups of people who will argue uh, slightly differently and it's going to come up again, uh, right around the holiday season, where what do you see? One commercial after another commercial after another commercial, which is selling what? It's selling perfume. And if you're selling perfume, you're selling pheromones and you're selling sex. And there we have a major connection uh, going into, uh, coming in. And then the, uh, uh, then what you can see in, the uh, amygdala, the basolateral and central nuclei, uh, which are uh, uh, here are getting information from the temporal lobe, from the hypothalamus, uh, and uh, then the dorsal limbic system, the habenula, where we talked about the fasciculus retroflexus. So we see all of these. So here are the major diagrams uh, and connections of the amygdala. And what I'm basically going to encourage you to do uh, between now and the next class is uh, look at these uh, literal connections and how they work. And there's one set of connections here. There's a second set of connections as drawn here. And then what we have is another interesting set of proje uh, uh, projections that have to do with fear, 
It has to do with pain. It has to do with aggression, all of these things. And you can see how the amygdala, especially through its indirect outputs of the basolateral, and then its direct outputs of the central nucleus go to many different parts of the brain to modulate an enormous number of emotionally laden types of responses. And then how uh, uh, the amygdala does that by getting all of these uh, immediate information and longer term information so as to do a correct coordinated response. And again, you have another nucleus there, and then we'll go on to the septum. But uh, I'll pick this up again with the amygdala uh, next, next week. So um, again, I'm not seeing uh, too many, uh, let's see if there's a question here. Studying my cat's aggression as we speak, of course. And you, you can uh, uh, basically uh, see that, and and uh, and uh, you know, a, a cat is a magnificent study of uh, observational consciousness and aggression and <laughs> behavior like that. You know, you, you, uh, the other night we have our seventeen-year-old orange female cat named Rue, you know, uh, Winnie the Pooh kind of fame. And this cat has not been to the vet in four to five years because she basically knows that a particular month goes by and everything. And all of a sudden we surreptitiously stick the cats into their boxes to get shipped off and she'll disappear. And then last night, She's obviously in pain because she hasn't gone to the bed. There's something with her ear, but you can't get it to the bed. So my wife decides to give her an antibiotic and we actually captured her and every guttural growl, every movement, every fight and, and whatever. Although I'm finding in her old age that if we did that three or four years ago, she'd disappear for, she'd be in a house somewhere for two weeks but she wouldn't come back. But in our dotage, she's coming back a little bit sooner, but there's like a 12 hour break. And it's always the thing of what you get is approach avoidance with her. She comes up and starts to come towards you. If you reach out, forget about it, she runs away. And only after a certain point where she's perpetually banging the back of our heads and everything, she, she then allows you to pet her a little bit versus our other cat, Welly, who is like, uh, is like toasted butter. As soon as you touch, uh, turns upside down, gives up the belly, rub me, rub me, rub me, and that's, you know, whatever. So uh, always, uh, uh, I always find if you basically want to study animal behavior, uh, get a cat, and by and large, always, and all the time we've been together, we've had anywhere from... Uh, uh, two to four cats. And right now we have 3.5 cats because we have another cat named Buddy. We have no idea where he goes or where he comes from, but he shows up, eats, uh, interacts with my wife, and then starts to meow because he wants to leave. Some very cold nights, we're hoping he'll just stay the night and he sort of tolerates us. But in any case, uh, what I'm always trying to do in these things is take not only the structure, but sort of the history as to where we're sort of coming from, how it ties into classic psychological or uh, neurological or neurosurgical or, or psychiatric types of things to basically look at how these things go together. So I'm um, finished uh, today. We just went through uh, the hypothalamus. We've entered into the limbic system. And we will continue to move on next week with the limbic system and then go into that wonderful world of the basal ganglia. So I'm done, John. We can cut this off. And at this point, I'll just say to everyone to have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Thanks. Bye. Have a good Bye. week. Yeah.